Welcome to Smoke and Bulls, the podcast about business, money, and lifestyle. I'm Tyler. I'm Dave. And today we're going to be speaking about how we got into this podcasting world. So, yeah. Dave, maybe tell me a little bit about what your primary business is and, and how you came into being interested in podcasting. Oh, uh, well, definitely. Uh, 28 years as, a, as an investment professional uh, portfolio manager. And I think, uh, you know, over all those years, you watch the way people, you know, get information out to their potential clients, clients, things of that nature. You've been around a long time too. So, I mean, we started back in the day of cold calls and seminars and pizza nights and all sorts of stuff. So I think times changed and, you know, like everybody else in the world, you know, we found ourselves with, a lot of time on our hands over the last year and not traveling to see our clients so how else did we you know do something in place of that so that's idea of podcast came up never really had heard one until we started thinking about it. that's true when we started thinking about making a podcast the big joke was well what podcasts do you guys follow and we were like we haven't really watched one before <laughs> so <laughs> bad yeah. so uh, we found this as a way i guess just to really get in touch with our clients again a way to stay in touch with our clients and not just our clients but try and just share some of the insights we have around uh our primary business which is our investment insurance planning business and some of the work that we do for for entrepreneurs is something that i think uh, is unique and that we can kind of share on a more a larger platform so podcasting became a, a fit for that yeah I, I think the big catalyst probably was the fact that we couldn't see our clients face to face. So, you know, if we had decided to tell all of our clients that we travel to see, by the way, we're not coming to see anymore, we're going to do it by Zoom, how many clients would we have lost? So forced into it, you know, Zoom became a big thing for us to do full blown meetings that we weren't doing before. And that kind of morphed into, well, if we can talk to our clients from a thousand kilometers away, why can't we talk to anybody? 2,000, 3,000 kilometers away. So that, that's the podcast yeah. of sharing ideas. Yeah, that was one thing that was great was sometimes we've got to train our clients on the technology that we want to use in order to operate our business. This was one where they self-trained. Like if they wanted to talk to their neighbor down the street, they had to use Zoom or they had to use a video call. Talk to the grandkids. Exactly. Whoever yeah. they wanted to get in touch with, they needed to embrace the, the new technology. So um, we're on board for that. So so anyway, that's you know getting us to the podcast range. And we've chatted a bit about here about what our business looked like, our primary business before we got to podcasting. Um, obviously, it being the invest in investment and wealth management side, how did you get into that investment side, the, the wealth management side? Yeah, a long time ago. You know, at a university, there wasn't a ton of jobs when I graduated. That was like 1992, and, you know, I wasn't the most studious uh, of students, and uh, my parents realized that. And so I think my, my mom working at the federal government, she was in charge of doing uh, retirement seminars and wellness seminars for the federal government. So they had a different financial speakers come in to talk to the employees of the federal government. And so after my mom heard them talking, she managed to get me in front of some of them and to look at a career. And uh, yeah, I don't think I could have done a normal nine to five job. I probably wouldn't have lasted. So this became uh, my career and it takes a long time. I think when you get rolling with it to realize it is your career or even surviving the first you know, two, three years, you watch a lot of people start. And even from when I started, I think there's 10 people that started with me. And after two years, there was two of us. And then, you know, it was kind of a stare down to who was going to drop next. But uh, I think uh, we, we survived. So that's how I got into it. And I just like the concept of, I think maybe more it was the concept of there's a way to make money without working, you know. So <laughs> how, do I get, how do I get into that? And how do I find a way to create wealth? And, and you know, it's morphed over the years because you got better educated, you became, uh, you know, kind of a master of your profession over time. Yes, I would agree. I, what really attracted me to that side of our business, our primary business, was talking to my dad's financial planner way back when I had just graduated university and didn't know what I was going to do with myself. And my dad's financial planner at the time <clears throat> had spoken really highly of this career and the ability to uh, uh, use it as a way to create a recurring revenue stream and, and design your own business. So uh, that, that got me into it and he pointed me in the right direction of the additional education I needed to get and away I went. Um, I mean, think about it, you, be, you were becoming an entrepreneur without knowing. That's you, right. You chose the entrepreneur way. I had no idea and didn't really become an entrepreneur until many years later. I mean, for the longest time, you're just doing whatever business you can do in order to pay your bills and you're really not running a business efficiently yet. Uh, once you get a little further in, then you're starting to hire 
hire on staff to help do some of the tasks that aren't money-making tasks for you, and, and you slowly grow your business. So, I mean, you and I met uh, back in 2007. That was when we met at a conference. Cause Banff. We this, yeah, in Banff. We had the same uh, back office at the time, Professional Investment Services Canada. They no longer exist. This can. Yeah, this can. <laughs> <laughs> So they're long gone, um, but uh, we met at that conference in 2007. A um, bit of background on us, uh, that 2007 conference led to me renting some office space from Dave. We worked together in that same space for, for three years, together but separate. We didn't have combined practices, but after about three years of working together, we, we realized we're doing a lot of joint work. We work in a very similar manner. And we were scaling, just like a good entrepreneurs, you got to find a your economies of scale and we could share reception area, we could share meeting rooms, we could share marketing, we could share client events, so. It made sense at, at that point to just smash our practices together and go after it yeah. as, a, as a couple, as a business owners that can advance our practice more quickly together than we can apart. Yeah. So that's, you know, 14 years ago, I, I guess, and uh, that's a long time. <laughs> That's I've only long. known my wife for 15 years, so <laughs> I barely know her longer than I've known you. <laughs> Maybe you should have met her before you met me. I did meet her before I met <laughs> you, but just barely. barely. Yeah. Ooh, see, she saved the day. She, did, she doesn't yeah. even know it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that brings us all the way up to today. We've obviously been really successful in that partnership, and we've watched, watched a lot of other partnerships in our careers, and, and in our business, we've watched them blow up uh, and, and, and fail. So we've been really lucky to succeed, uh, and that's brought us to here, where we, we're always looking for new ways to advance our business, and, and stay in contact with our clients and educate our clients. And, and that's what this platform is going to be used for. If you think about that, I mean, just even your comment there about, uh, you know, since we're going to spend our podcast talking about entrepreneurs and growth of businesses and how to scale up and things of that nature, you think about how we got together and then you're looking at others that we've seen that have failed. And I think, you know, you got to look at some of the differences of the things that we did. And we were very, I would say, meticulous about the, the business plan and about the outs. You know, um, and by outs, uh, you know, almost uh, your business will. You know, uh, we decided to write down on paper, you know, this is our agreement. This is if one of us leaves, this is if one of us passes away. We wrote our, you know, our shareholders agreement, technically, if you want to call it, without really having a corporation at that time. And we wrote it all out ahead of time. And that would just, that would allow one of us to get out. And I think that's probably one of the things we'll talk about over and over throughout. Uh, these podcasts is the fact that most businesses don't have anything in place to deal with the failing of one of the partners or you know you, you end up with that partner's spouse technically as your partner if something happens so I think that's going to be something we touch on quite a bit. I would agree and I think one of the things that that we did right out of the gates was we planned to fail I mean that's what you're referencing and, and nobody plans to fail everybody comes out of the shoot planning to succeed and shoot the lights out and, and that's our hope but we had to lay the groundwork for if there was failure if there was a falling out between us or or if one of us weren't weren't able to work what were the out clauses how did how did we separate our businesses and that's no fun to plan like that I remember yeah. working through those stages yeah. uh, but man I think by getting that right and knowing uh, what could go wrong in the, at the outset was helpful in making sure that we were on the same page going still, forward. Still, still easier than writing up a prenup. Yeah. It was virtually the same thing, but for exactly. business. But uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so that you know gets us to you know through our through our careers and and what we've done to get to where we are today. What's you know, outside of work, because we've already talked about being an entrepreneur, sometimes gives you the ability to have some free time in your schedule and and different sections of free time that maybe a normal employee wouldn't have. So where you can yeah. take bulk periods of time off, or where you can align your day in such a way that you can do some neat activities. So what's some of the fun stuff that uh, you get into when you're uh, in your free time? Yeah, I, I think obviously you know the growth of our businesses over the years has kind of provided us with the ability and talking once again the, the technology being able to work from afar in different uh, situations i don't think no matter what i do with my free time you're still kind of tied into this all the time um and you know you have to set some time aside to work on those things and you have to uh kind of mix them together with pleasure and a lot of people you know there's a lot of talk about don't bring your work home or or, you know, when you go on holidays, turn your phones off, all that. And, I, you know, I've never found that to work for, for me. Uh, partially, I think some of that's uh, if you have a, I don't know, much more stressful job than what we have. Uh, you know, I, I love coming to work every day and I love the job, what we do, and I love the way it's set up. So I don't, I don't feel like I have to go away and turn my phone off. I want to stay on top of it and it doesn't really ruin a day for me. So, you know, spend my time 
you know, have a summer cottage in Ontario and I can go work there for two months and I can still accomplish as many calls and as many meetings as I do right now from there. Uh, probably the best thing that is, is it's uh, two hours ahead of this time. So by the time I settle in, I can actually call my clients before nine o'clock uh, and they probably wonder what the heck I'm doing, you know? So it's, uh, I picked up two hours uh, on the other side. So I, I get a lot of my work done before noon, which is awesome. Uh, and then can enjoy uh, the time with the family, and that's that's what we do. You know, soak up the sun, and you know. And then there's the normal, the holidays, the trips, and you know, lots of golf. Uh, if I can get as many golf rounds in as I can, so. Yeah, I told my wife. She said, "What is your, uh, what are your resolutions this year in January?" And I never do like New Year's resolutions. And I said, "My resolution this year is to play more golf." And she's like, "What?" And I'm like, "Why can't a resolution be something fun? Why does a resolution always have to be? Oh, I want to work out more. I got to lose weight, or I got to change my eating habits, or whatever it might be." I was like, "No, I, I need to get more golf games in this year." It was pretty weak last year. They had COVID-19 shut down my men's league, so I didn't get to golf as much. I'm yeah. a golfer as well. Probably don't get nearly as many rounds in as you do, but maybe this year. That's my my resolution. Well, I think it works. It's my only <laughs> resolution that ever comes true. Hey, well, <laughs> you see, I'll, I haven't I'll, knocked the weight off, but I should golf a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's you know one of mine. I guess, and one of the things I enjoy to do. Um, I, I wanted to go back to one of the comments you made about our job's not that stressful, and I would agree. I, I don't find a lot of stress in our job, but I think I don't want you to diminish, or I don't think we should diminish the the uh, work that comes with our career and the business that we've created. I think if you plugged somebody else into our business, their stress would go through the roof. And I think because we enjoy our business and we enjoy our clients and we enjoy the work that we do, our stress levels less. So we, we I think, are really lucky in that sense that that we picked a career that we're happy with. Whereas if somebody wasn't happy in their, their career, they're probably super stressed. It doesn't matter what it is that they're doing. So uh, it's, it's how we manage our clients too. I think, you know, it took us a lot of years to get to that stage where, you know, we're discretionary money managers. We manage the portfolios. Uh, we've picked the way we run money. Uh, that's the most effective we think for our clients. But at the same time, you know, never in my career did I ever want to go home and worry that we've set something up that's going to, that I, I don't want those phone calls every morning from, from clients. And we, I've never, I mean, occasionally you get those. You're, not, you're never going to get away from that. But, uh, you know, when the markets go up and down, which they always will do, uh, we don't have that barrage of phone calls and then nothing, barrage of phone calls and then nothing. And I think that's testament to how we've structured everything. And I think it had to be structured that way or I probably want to survive in the business anyways. I don't, I don't want to go home at night and worry about, you know, have, have we done something wrong? You know, we shouldn't have done that with that client because if this goes this way and it blows up, you know, that client's out of money or bankrupt or, you know, destitute. That, that's, that was never the, the, the structure and the plan. So I think that's, I guess when I said there's no stress, no job, I think it's because we've designed it that way to get it to the point that as long as we're following what we do in our, our setup and we keep working with our clients the way we do, we don't have that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, it's it's the, the things that we try to avoid, which helps us avoid our stress. And and there's a lot of guys in our industry who, who do choose those paths. And I guess that's what they enjoy to do with their business, but not for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you travel to the cottage in the summers, golf in the summers. Do you do anything in the winter or just hibernate? Well, uh, yeah, hibernate. I think uh, with the cold winters we have here in Alberta, sometimes you do hibernate. Uh, but, you know, it's go somewhere warm if I can, like everybody else. Um, you know, with kind of uh, children that are older, it's uh, we can disappear without the kids sometimes. So that's it's a lot easier than to pick a place to go and not have to worry as much uh, about having to find uh, someone to take care of your kids. Well, I guess in my situation with uh, older kids and uh, a younger child, uh, we just make the older kids watch the younger <laughs> child when we go away. So you know, we're pretty much good to go anytime. So yeah. I, I love traveling. I mean, it's great to see other other places. Uh, it is, a, you know, I think everybody missed it this year in a sense when you think about just sometimes just kicking back. You know, uh, you know, Julie gets mad at me sometimes because we're going on vacation and I don't watch TV, but I'll plop down on the couch with a remote control and five hours later, she's like, you know, we're on vacation. Like, let's go do something. I go, I am, you know, like I'm just totally relaxed now type thing. So I'd, I could just sit and do nothing on a vacation. And as long as I'm close to a pool and some ice cubes, I guess I'm all right, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah we all missed our vacations this year, and, and we do the same thing um, in the winters. 
Um, we started skiing a bit this year. My family's a bit younger, right? So I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, so we can't escape them that easily yet. Yeah. Um, but uh, we bring them with when we go on vacations. And uh, this year, yeah, it's been skiing, snowboarding, uh, a little bit of uh, snowmobiling. We've got a couple of snow machines now, and that was, you know, we live on an acreage, so we get to do that yeah. stuff. And uh, so that kept us busy through the winter, and otherwise my summers are, are camping. We've got an RV that we pull around all over the place, and uh, the kids love that. That's how I grew up. We went RVing all the time in the summers. You all booked for the summer? I you booked one. Find a site. <laughs> yeah, no, I booked I booked one so far and we were trying to get an extended two weeks day yeah. and uh, they were booked up. The most they could give me was five days, but the campsite's got pools there, hot tubs, uh, horse riding, pens for the kids, playgrounds. <laughs> Got a launching pens scene. for the kids. Pens for the kids, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jeez. Throw them in there. <laughs> <laughs> a high fence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Playgrounds for the kids, yeah. and then uh, they've got ATV trails right at the campsite that go into the mountains. Okay. So you could bring your machines with you if you want. Yeah. yeah, and then just drop everything right there and take off. So, nice. so that's the that's the fun stuff, I guess that that we get to do, or some of the fun stuff that we get to do. And I guess that's you know in a way what we're going to talk about. Uh, you know, you can talk about money and entrepreneurship and businesses so much. Uh, you know, what happens when you've, you've worked really hard over the years? You know, these are the things that you and I are starting to do. Um, when we talk about other entrepreneurs and, and their life, uh, you, you know, we want to talk about the lifestyle. Uh, let's face it, uh, when, you, you're, you know, when you start out as an entrepreneur, you're going to work a lot of years with nothing. And potentially you're going to fail, but uh, you know, you're after that that win uh, that provides you the time and the luxury to do a lot of things. So, you know, a lot of times the lifestyle of entrepreneurs are envious to others perhaps, but uh, um, it lets uh, those people really pursue the avocations that they really love. And sometimes those are a little weird compared to the average bear, but uh, I think we're going to spend some time talking about some of those things too. When we talk with our guests, uh, you know, we might talk business, we might talk stock markets, we might talk uh, structure of their, you know, world, um, but we're also going to talk about what they really like to do uh, with their spare time. Some of them might say their business, so who knows, right? Yeah, you're right, and I think that'll be the fun side of this podcast is not just learning about the strategies that we use in our primary business, but uh, learning about what entrepreneurs get to do for fun, and it could be anything. I mean, you always reference fly fishing. I mean, I don't fly fish. I don't either, but... I'll get somebody in here yeah. who wants to talk about fly fishing. Let's learn about it. Maybe it's fun, and it's something Expect we want to organize and, and get a guy's trip together and do that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we know what we like to do for fun. We want to learn about what other guys are doing for fun um, and encourage our viewers to, you know, jump on board and, and share sure. with us what they're doing for Maybe fun. Maybe they want so. to tell us what they do for fun. I mean, there's yeah. all sorts of things we could probably learn. Yeah, we can learn all sorts and, and include that in our podcast sure. and, and roll with it. So, yeah. um, we also plan to do some, I guess, uh, what would you call it? We don't really have a name for it yet, but time. Or, um, current events type conversations, yeah. uh, topic of the topic, day, trending topic topics. Day, yeah, sure. So we'll chat about what's latest in the news. I mean, who knows what's blowing up that day? Uh, pre previously, it might have been you know GameStop stock going through the roof and going crazy, and that being driven up by a, a group buying pattern. And we chat about that and share our insights on sure. it. So it's really just going to be a open conversation on those topics that we that we dive into. Yeah. Um, we wanted to do some webinars. So you mentioned a way that we used to grow our business was the old-fashioned way of doing seminars, and then you, you narrow down the, the field of people in your crowd, and, and you end up getting a client out of it. But uh, our webinars are probably going to be based on initially our, our, our business, our primary business in the, in the wealth management arena, and we'll teach people about doesn't matter what the concept is. We've got a million of them, whether it be as simple as RSP planning to more complicated like individual pension plans or, or insured retirement strategies. We're going to talk about those types of concepts, and we'll do a webinar on each uh, thing, and it'll be a series of webinars that we can then share with, uh, with our viewers, with our clients. Yeah, you'll find it on our site, <coughs> yeah. yeah, for sure, yeah, scopenwolves.com. Create a library of, of stuff on there. Yeah, yeah, so that'll be our, our other topics. Okay. What we're going to try and tie in is kind of not entrepreneur of the day, but maybe we'll, we'll talk to some successful entrepreneurs, maybe some people in the middle of their entrepreneurial journey and uh, have them in and uh, really do a deep dive. Uh, that, that might be the hard part is finding someone who's willing to disclose the questions we want to ask, but I think getting them in here and talking about how they became successful or how they think they're going to become more successful, how they've structured their business. And I think the best that is going to come out of this for for the listeners and for the people we're going to talk to is, you know, we, we have all the tools to help these uh, individuals. Uh, but I think as we talked about when it comes to like shareholders agreements and uh, having insurance on your business partner, all those things, I think we'll find that most people don't have a lot of this in place. And so I think when we're talking 
about someone specific. Um, you know, hopefully they're they're good to hear some of the things we might throw at them. Uh, it'd be great to see and hear from people who are set up well because, I mean, let's face it, you and I have been around a long time, but it's great to hear different strategies perhaps too. Maybe we haven't thought of something that we think we know and uh, we should always keep an open mind from that side of it. But I think, uh, you know, Entrepreneur of the Month or whatever, I mean, it's not going to be like the McDonald's wall or whatever. You <laughs> put the picture. Maybe we'll fill the back wall here with people we've the entrepreneurs we've talked to. Yeah, we were wondering how to decorate this place. Maybe that's a good way to do it. <laughs> um, I think some of our other guests that we want to get on are, are people specific to our business as well. So there's some really unique experts in the experts in the financial industry that most people don't have access to. These guys are sometimes people that you would see on BNN uh, interviewed there, and, and hopefully we're going to get that kind of access to them. Sometimes just with our, our primary business being the investment business and and being uh, somewhat successful there, we've got access to some of those guys, and and we've already expressed some interest or had people express interest back to us that they wouldn't mind appearing on the podcast. Sure. So that'll be cool, and we can get some of those uh, I guess bigger names than than people that are just here in our local community and have them on to chat about yeah. you know, what their strategies are. Of both of them. And I think even some of those some of those who would appear on BNN or you might see on there, I think uh, they like talking about something a little bit more, uh, what's the word, not, not just a specific to the, to the questioning that uh, they're handling on BNN. They want to talk maybe fly fishing, you know what I mean? Like they're going to yeah. want to talk about uh, how it ties into entrepreneurship, you know, instead of just the specialized view that they're sharing on a regular basis. So we're, we're going to give them a chance to open up a bit and, and talk about anything financial or business or entrepreneurial. Um, that's the key for the, the people we want to bring in. And lifestyle too, like you said, I'd, I'd be interested to hear the lifestyle of, of some of these guys and, and see what they do outside of the stuff they do in front of their computer screen every day. Yeah. So let's uh, talk about today's smoking topic. Today's smoking topic about um, what people expect after COVID is wrapped up and, and the vaccines have rolled out and, and people are getting back to work, stores, restaurants, movie theaters, airlines, everything's opening back up and we're back to life as normal or whatever that new normal looks like. Mm-hmm. What do you think that's going to look like? Well, I, obviously, I think you know, there's 9 million opinions on things like this. Uh, I think I'll focus more on a comment about when it's truly kind of open, not this partial or it's never going to open, will never be the same. I, I'm not going to go with, with any of those type of things. I'm just going to go with the fact that a lot of people locked up for a long time. A lot of money was being stashed and saved as much as people think, uh, you know, the economic times are a bit tough for this year. I think it was for a lot of people, uh, but for a lot of other people, they pocketed tons and tons of money. Uh, how many people have airline credits, flight credits, maybe hotel credits? So I think, I think we're going to see a big push on people traveling and and doing things that maybe they would have done normally, but I, I also think we're gonna see some people who are gonna start doing things that they normally wouldn't do because they were afraid that maybe they won't get a chance to do them. So the sheer volume of people, I think, joining in on some leisure things that are not the leisure things of last year. I mean, last year, the leisure things were, you know, uh, having a look at their cardboard boxes in the basement to find out what baseball cards they had, you know, uh, those type of things. So I think you're gonna see people Uh, And there's going to be great competition for seats on a plane and competition for uh, spots at a resort. I think prices are going to go through the the roof. I mean, let's face it, the airlines uh, haven't made any money, uh, nor have hotels and other leisure operators. So uh, I would expect your average flight uh, is going to be, you know, one and a half to two times the price you would normally pay. So... Those are probably pretty accurate comments, and you're right, that industry's been shut down, but it's not the only one. So, um, you know, I would think even locally in your own communities, uh, restaurants, uh, local gym memberships, all that stuff will increase in price just to try and recoup the complete shutdown of their business for a year. And although governments around the world have helped, you know, those types of uh, businesses, not to the extent that that business would have uh, been doing on its own. So, yeah, everything's going to ramp back up. And... (coughs) I'd read some comments and it was talking about the recovery after COVID and that that recovery isn't like a normal recovery after a recession or something like that. This recovery is a global recovery. And the last time we've really seen, you know, a global economy shut down is after a world war. There's really no times that an economy, the world economy actually shuts down. So 
there's uh, people the out depression. there. Depression. Well, the Great Depression, maybe. Yeah. Right, and, and what brought that out was you know the World War II happening and, and that ramp up. But yeah. shutting down for a, for a war so that all of your efforts go into that wartime activity and then reopening after that is what I've read is, is what we're going to experience after this. That our economies aren't going to only recover and get back to where they are, but they're going to rip. Yeah. So. Um, that's exciting, I guess, but it's also somewhat worrisome because the inflation of, of products around you, whether it be going to your local restaurant, traveling to your favorite destination, all that, all those prices are all going to probably rise. Uh, but and some that, of them have already. Oh yeah, yeah. and with that, everything else rises around it. So your markets are going to are going to rip, and your real estate market is going to rip. We're already starting to see evidence of that. So, as COVID, I think, as COVID continues to play itself out and the vaccine continues to roll out, uh, we're going to continue to to recover in such a way that we've never seen before. So, and every, everybody back to their offices. Uh, good question. I think there's going to be a lot of people that probably stay home. I think there's going to be a lot of businesses that take a look at how they've designed their operation and realize that they can be just as effective having some people working from home. Um, what does that mean to the commercial real estate market? I, I don't know. Um, I think that's a real tough one. I mean, as much as COVID o is over, everybody's vaccinated uh, and off everybody goes, are people going to still wear masks or, or is that going to be something we're going to keep wearing are people going to shake hands anymore are people going to ride in an elevator with you uh you know and that's part of getting people up and down elevators in you know big cities with office towers and condos and and you know who wants to ride that anymore are those are those uh real estate markets going to be hurt by this in the long term uh who knows i mean you're seeing a lot of migration uh and you see it in the real estate numbers to suburban for the outer, outer parts of the city. People want uh, a bigger backyard, more space, more rooms and to hide from each other. I don't know, you know, things like that. Uh, I think that continues on uh, for quite some time. Um, but I think from the business point of view, yeah, it, like you said, there's gonna be just so much activity. Uh, I mean, how many small businesses, how many entrepreneurs went under uh, because of this? So the question is, do they resurface or are they done with the game? Uh, are you going to have some people who see the holes in the market and are able to ramp up businesses that got shut down? Some of those smaller type businesses that's, you know, you look at strip malls and all sorts of places. There's, you know, for sale signs, lease signs. Um, you know, are you going to see a bunch of people jump into the entrepreneurial spirit and fill that void uh, and to provide that service? Uh, that one will be interesting. I'm not sure how fast people are going to want to commit a large chunk of money uh, even though, you know, the belief is that things will expand and good times are ahead, uh, you know, it's a risk, right? Yeah, I think with the, with the people get that fear of missing out, uh, I think, too, when, when situations are, are, everything's rising so quickly. So I think you will have entrepreneurs come back and, and want to fill that void. You're, you're right, it's a risk uh, to be an entrepreneur, but um, that's always there. It's always a risk to be an entrepreneur. And, and I think the people out there who are entrepreneurial driven, who, who would be in that role, are going to be in that role no matter what. So they're probably going to come back and spot their opportunities and see where they can add their two cents and, and make a profit from it. So you think there'll be enough people who are not entrepreneurs as of yet who are going to jump in and fill the void for those people who were the entrepreneurs who said, I'm too close to retirement or I'm not going back into this? You know, are we going to lose? Are we going to have a net loss of small businesses and entrepreneurs uh, a year from now? Or are we going to be recovering and surge ahead? I, I just wonder. I, I think if you've been an entrepreneur for quite some time, you were within the reach of retirement. You lost a chunk of money here. Um, you know, you know how, how 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 hard of work it is to how much work you have to put in to build that business. Do you want to get started? Do you want to jump in again? I guess if it's in the same type of business that you're used to, maybe your ability to get rolling again is is a lot quicker uh, than someone who's new. Uh, I just wonder if, if people are going to get scared away. Uh, the fact that you can run a successful business for a lot of years and then within one year, something out of your control can wipe you out. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, that's for sure. If a guy goes into it thinking like that, I think part of the, you know, the, the way we view things is from a, a more seasoned, more mature business. And when you look back to how we started our own businesses, you look back and go, man, I don't want to do that again. I don't think I could do that again. And it's because we know how hard it was, but ignorance is sometimes bliss, as they say. And if you're getting in at the start, you don't know the uphill struggle that you're going to have, and you're going to do it and, and make it work. So craft dinner days is what we call them. Craft dinner. Can you craft dinner for three years straight to know that? And that's not an automatic, but 
to have someone tell you maybe you'll make a hundred thousand dollars a year in year four, but you're you're going to basically eat nothing for three years. Yeah. And most people, a lot of people say, well, I could do that, and but there's not a lot of people who do it. You know. You got to start at the right time too. I know when I started, I had no no commitments. I mean, I was renting my my apartment downtown. I had no family, like besides my immediate family, I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. If you're trying to start a business and that's what you have hanging over you already, that's going to be a real slug to try and develop your business. So I think the entrepreneurs coming in might be people, you know, young starting professionals or, or people in their, their fields that are going to jump in and, and do it because they can afford those lean years. Yeah. Well, I remember the, I, you know, from the time when I was a, a manager in a financial services firm and we were hiring new new advisors and new potential advisors, uh, you know, the big things back then were, you know, uh, the three reasons you would fail were failure to not get your point across, uh, or failure to get your point across, sorry, um, not having any backup, uh, as in you came into it with no money, uh, per se. Uh, and then the third would be basically, you know, no support. So if you're married uh, or you're, you've got a family to support, they might be unwilling to let that happen. Uh, you know, if you're not successful quick enough, guess what? They're going to say you got to quit. You got to find something else. And that's the thing you have to, you know, you have to stick it out. Uh, success takes time. And I think that's, that's a big thing that I worry about in this bounce back from COVID is whether people have the same tenacity to wait it out to be successful uh, instead of expecting to be successful. And I, I guess that's, I'm, I'm showing my age a bit because, you know, I think when I, I chat with my kids, I guess I'm not, I won't point one out, I might pluralize this, you know, it's the, the sense of you just believe it and you wish wish that you want it to happen for yourself, it happens. And I'm always, so, oh, it's, I'm not sure how successful that is, but maybe it is. Maybe I'm just old school. Maybe you are, or maybe definitely you are, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Light me, buddy. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Smoking Bulls, the podcast about business, money, and lifestyle. If you enjoyed what you saw today, check us out on our social media platforms and at our website, smokingbulls.com.